that there is no outside text. Sometimes misunderstood as everything is text in our lives because of his translation from the French or text. He meant actually that everything one writes or does is bound by the sociocultural context in which it is produced. Eisenman's main focus in, er, among post-structuralism was on semiotics namely the study of signs and symbols and their interpretation. The Houses series is the manifesto for an architectural methodology that would later be adopted by many architecture schools, in especially the East Coast of the US and around the world in the decades to come, particularly with digitization and digital ways of thinking, the process-driven method would find a very uh, a good fit. But the houses of uh, the 70s are a manifesto for Eisenman's dictum, process, not result. Hence, the diagrams of the houses are what's most important about them. The process is actually so much more important than, than the result that in house school, six, the couple's bed is split in two the US by and architecture with a capital A. It's perhaps the first in history where architecture potentially saves a marriage. There is, of course, the famous Cedric Price story, where a couple comes to the British architect and after lengthy discussions about how their house should be, Cedric Price tells them, what you need is not a house, it's a divorce. Eisenman's process-driven architecture and play on signs and signification of architectural elements is a little bit like Haneke's films. Take, for example, the film Funny Games. In the 1997 Funny Games, the five main characters perform in two juxtaposed genres. For the villains, the film is a comedy. It's a farce. For the victims, the film is a tragedy. Throughout the film, the villains have complete control over the film as a comedy, to the extent that when one of them is shot by the protagonist, one of the victims, the second the second one, the second villain, finds in the living room a remote control to rewind the film to change what just happened. Also reminding us that we are, of course, in a film. What's so powerful about Funny Games, and in our case, Eisenman's architecture, is that the two genres of comedy and tragedy do not mix together. The villains do not exit the domain of the farce, of the comedy ever, and the victims that of the tragedy they live in. And the film hosts them both and even confronts them, makes them interact. In a similar fashion in Eisenman's houses, the domestic bourgeois environment of suburban houses confronts architecture. Eisenman, like Haneke, is not complacent. While traditionally architecture enables domesticity, here the architecture is making it difficult forcing the occupants and the furniture to adapt. It's as if the occupant of the house is a stranger to her or his own house. Another important aspect of the house series is the fluidity and mediums Eisenman's exploration opens up. Perhaps the strongest example of that is the axonometric model of house 10. This model is to my knowledge a first in understanding a model as a drawing and vice versa. The model is sheared so that when you look at it from a 45, 45, 45 degree angle, like in this picture here on the right, it appears as a parallel projection. The model is hence becoming devoid of perspective. While perspective subjectifies our perception, we can say that a parallel projection drawing, such as a plan, an elevation, or any oblique projection, such as an isometric or axonometric drawing, can be called objective. The play on the transition from model to drawing will be familiar with anyone who is studying or studied architecture in the past decades within digital ways of drawing and making. When we ask Rhino to do a make 2D, the software performs exactly the same operations as whoever built the model for house 10. Now, if you really are into the differences between isometric and axonometric drawings, 
you will know that in order to get an axonometric drawing of a 3D model, you will need to shear it exactly like this model was sheared years before the first 3D modeling software was invented. But perhaps the boldest medium inversion Eisenman did was on a photo of House 2 that was exquisitely edited. Often captioned in magazines of its day as a photo of a model, this photo was taken, uh, quoting from Sarah Hearn's article on the photo, by Randall Corman, who was then an assistant in Peter Eisenman's office, who rented a helicopter, a Piper PA-28 Cherokee, from the White Plains Airport in upstate New York and flew it to Hardwick, Vermont. There, using the piloting skills he had acquired during his recent military service and a Konica SLR camera with a telephoto lens, he took a photograph of Eisenman's recently completed House 2 from above. All this to say that conventions in architecture are what we make of them, maybe. To know that to know the conventions doesn't mean to follow them, but reinvent and rethink them. And by doing so, reinventing and rethinking architecture altogether. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you for, is that the end of the presentation? Yes. Okay, so uh, everybody give the virtual applause for Alishan. Um, wait. So yeah, so uh, thank you for sharing the screen just to, to have some more yeah. images and projects that keep rolling what we talk. Cool. So yeah, uh, we're going to move to our virtual roundtable discussion, uh, which is we, we will um, introduce uh, four other uh, speakers who will join us. Mm. Okay, uh, I will I will invite them one by one, and also uh, uh, reading about their their bio directly. Okay, the first one is Mr. Thomas Leeser. Uh, Thomas Leeser is internationally known for his iconic architectural designs, and at all scales, Thomas' uh, commitment to architecture extends beyond practicing in the field. Uh, for the past thirty years, he has been an architecture professor at Pratt Institute. Cornell University, Harvard University, the Cooper Union, uh, Columbia University, Parsons School of Design, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Illinois Institute of Technology, and Princeton, Prince, Princeton University. He's currently teaching at Pratt Institute. Uh, Thomas uh, specializes in museums, theater, broadcast, and educational facilities. Thomas worked at Eisenman Architects throughout the 80s and played a key role in the office, uh, important projects such such as the Wexner Center of the Greater and the Greater Columbus Convention Center. Uh, he also co-edited uh, the book on Eisenman's La Villette project, The Coral Works, a collaboration between Eisenman and the philosopher uh, Jacques Arida. Uh, hello, Thomas. Uh, uh, you sh you could join us and saying hi to the hi, to the hi. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is sort of a, a, a kind of, for me, very moving moment because Peter and I go back a long, long time. And um, uh, it's actually a little bit shocking to me um, because I, I was there, yes, in the 80s until 1989, 90, which is 30 years ago. Um, uh, which is a long time, and, and so like I, I, I actually hadn't really thought about how how, how long ago this is, um, and uh, I'm sort of trying to remember the time, in, you know, when when actually I first met Peter was very funny. I, you just showed the New York Five Architects. I studied in Germany, and um, this book was of course um, for for me a kind of eye opener because you know German architecture education is very technical. Um, you know, you learn how to draw stairs and how to make roofs not leak and, um, um, and uh, you know, f f uh, things like this. And But I also knew, and I, I don't quite remember who said this or where it's coming from, but, you know, my father was an architect and he always said, like, if a roof doesn't leak, it's not good architecture. And um, um, so I, I saw this book and I, I realized that Eisenman's buildings must leak, you know, because... Um, uh, there, there was something about them, and I visited uh, uh, 
I visited his his uh, one of his buildings on my first trip to the U.S. and um, with my father and and uh, my father said like look it's made out of cardboard this is good architecture because you must leave <laughs> and um, so I I eventually um, applied to Cooper Union to study in Cooper Union and 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 had. Peter, as in my very first class with Peter, and he was reading Tafuri, um, and my English was so bad that uh, I said to Peter, "Look, Peter, I don't understand the word. I don't think I, it's useful for to, for me to take this class." And Peter said, "Don't worry about it. Nobody understands a word from from of this text. So just sit down and 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 stay with me." And as I stayed with him for ten years, um, which which was sort of uh, you know a, a very sort of forming time for me i guess and, and you know peter and i sort of collaborated on, on a lot of projects that um that have you know become uh for me essential in my education well what a story uh it's just flying back through 80s i guess um yeah we're, we're, we're going to talk more about it so yeah uh, we're, we're moving to an, uh our second speaker which is uh ariane and laurie harrison uh Ariane Harrison is an architect and educator. Uh, she is the coordinator of the MS programs in architecture and urban design at uh, Pratt Graduate. Uh, she worked at Eisenman Architect from 2006 to 2008, edited 10 canonical buildings by Peter Eisenman, and taught at Yale School of Architecture from 2006 to 2017. She received her AB from Princeton uh, and her uh, Master of Art architecture from Columbia um, GSAP, GSAPV, uh, excellence in design, and he her PhD from New York University. Uh, please, wel please welcome Ms. Ariana Laurie Harrison. Um, <laughs> hello, hi Randy, thank you so much for the, for the invitation, and Ali Khan, thank you for your, your really beautiful, um, rich, uh, talk on you know walking us through so much of what what Peter has done and I, I think when you cited this term of a medium inversion a, a consistent reworking of the mediums as well as the inversion of the ideas it's I think a very powerful and I, I would say accurate reading um, I I'll give a little uh, background as well so I met Peter when I was just graduating from my MRC at GSAP I had really really wanted to uh, talk to Peter because I was interested in a French philosopher named Maurice Blanchot who is allied to many of the schools of thought that Ali Khan uh, mentioned and I emailed and called and like was not getting through um, I think this was a few months actually <laughs> and uh, and then Peter came to talk at uh, at Columbia and I thought aha you know He's here. <laughs> I will talk to him. He cannot. He can't avoid me anymore. And uh, and we after the lecture, uh, we we started speaking, and it turned out that Peter was actually very interested in Maurice Blanchot's work. And I went to uh, work for Peter um, and taught with him at Yale in the advanced studios, and then that that sort of morphed into. Um, teaching contemporary theory at Yale. And that's, that's really where, um, you know, Peter has given, I mean, the, the kind of foundations in not just the disciplinary conversations between architects, which is one aspect of the book we did together, 10 Canonical Buildings. Um, let me see, I could I don't know if this is the place to talk about 10 canonical buildings or if that comes in a little bit later. I'm just not quite sure about the format here. We, can, we, can. we will, we will, hmm. we will, okay. we will uh, talk about it after. The okay. So this is just hello. <laughs> Great. Yes. Yes. It's very, very nice introduction. How you met you, because to meet it in person is always, always the, the better ideas, you know, like you said, it's unavoidable, unavoidable. <laughs> Pardon my English. So the third one will be Elisa Turby. Uh, Elisa Turby is a critic at Yale University School of Architecture, YSOA, uh, where she also coordinates the dual degree from program between YSOA and uh, the Yale School of the Environment. Her writing, her writings uh, have been published in Locke, Dirk, and Pulp 
in addition to a forthcoming piece in Perspecta. Uh, most recently, she, she guest edited Log 47, titled Overcoming Carbon Form, an issue dedicated to redefining the relationship between architectural form and uh, our dominant energy paradigm. She also uh, co-wrote a book with Peter Eisman titled um, Lateness, uh, forthcoming in May 2020. As we know, it's already out now. In addition, she teaches studio, formal analysis, and a, a course on carbon form at the Cooper Union. She is a co-founder of Outside Development, an architectural practice. Hello, Elisa. You could join with us now. Hi. Uh, Thank you so hello. much for having me. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, so I guess I should say how I met Peter. Yeah, maybe. It's just yeah. A, um, so I met Peter when I was a graduate student at Yale, and um, I, he was actually um, present in my very early education because um, when I was there, formal analysis was required in your first semester. And uh, so that was my introduction to Peter as his student. And uh, I really liked formal analysis as a class. I thought it really helped me make sense of what it was that I was supposed to be doing um, in architecture. It, it taught me what, you know, what the language was that was um, at stake and you know, the ways in which I could really start to um, manipulate space. And you know, it started to give me a vocabulary and a syntax. And so I became uh, Peter's TA and then I stayed with him in formal analysis um, for two years as I finished grad school. And then um, afterwards I worked in Peter's office and then taught with him. And so then I was teaching formal analysis with him and studio and a seminar. And uh, while I was at the office, we were also writing this book, Lateness, which, which you just saw. Um, so my relationship with Peter has been, um, you know, through, through work and through teaching. Um, but uh, it also, you know, has, you know, it's been many years now. And I think in the, in the process of working on a book together, um, you know, it's been a really wonderful way to get to know him. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's how we know each other. Thank you. Um, okay, I will uh, introduce the fourth one. The last one will be Arden Tuzun. Uh, I guess I actually familiar with him uh, when I was joining this uh, Fadia workshop uh, two years ago in La Biennale Venezia in Turkish Pavilion. He's one of the curator of Turkish Pavilion. Well, Ardem Tuzin is an architect based in New York, presently leading the design team for Eisenman Architects. He received his Bachelor of Architecture degree at Istanbul Technical University and Master of Science in Architecture degree at Pratt Institute. Uh, he was awarded with the first prize at Çekirge Square Competition in 2017 and the National Architecture Award in Turkey with his The Giant Machine Project in 2016. Erdem was one of the associate creators uh, of Vardia, uh, or The Shift, which was presented at the Pavilion of Turkey for La Biennale di Venezia in the 16th Architectural Exhibition in 2018. He is uh, a co-founder of Herkes Ichin Mimarlik Architecture for All, uh, a nonprofit and independent architecture organization based in Istanbul, devoted to offering solution to social problems from an architectural perspective. So, hello, Erdem. Hello, Randy. Uh, thanks for the invitation and uh, making this uh, a huge meeting, actually. And Alijan for. Uh, also, thank you for the presentation and also the invitation. Um, since everyone talked about like how he, they met um, with Peter, actually, like my story um, like goes back way way before like I started. Um, I, I moved to the US. Uh, actually, I was a recent graduate from high school, and there was this international um, architectural uh, meeting of. Uh, uh, called UIA, I believe, and I was like 17 years old. Like even though like my parents are architects, I had no idea about Peter's work and who he was. And I was like in that summer, I was planning to move to Istanbul for my undergrad education, and uh, I, I I knew that there was this event in Istanbul going on, um, and like there. Uh, and famous architects were gonna come and like make these presentations, and then like in one day, uh, I saw a photo on the, on the national uh, news, news uh, newspaper 
uh, with a with a person who wears a Galatasaray jersey uh, in like in front of this huge crowd and like like and the and that title was saying that like world famous architect Peter Weizmann like presented his work with wearing with this like uh, soccer jersey and then like that's how like uh, like uh, like I like first first this was the first time that I heard uh, Peter's name and like started doing, uh, making a research and started reading about him etc so this is this was like kind of like my first uh uh introduction to him and then like after i moved to new york and had my uh master's studies in pratt uh they were working on like eisen architects were working on this project in istanbul uh then i mean i was very interested in this project and basically i applied for job and then Peter like wouldn't hire someone that uh, he didn't know, like probably uh, like he didn't uh, thought or, you know, like had internship or anything. So it was kind of a, a hard time getting accepted in, in the office, but uh, probably it worked well. Uh, and I've been with uh, Peter in the last seven years, even though like now we are trying to adopt working from a distance which is still, you know, like we're trying to figure out. Uh, but these kind of meetings are also, I think, helping. And, uh, you know, just to adapt and like see Peter like more often. Yeah, I mean, this is our new normal, I guess. But uh, this is the silver lining from the pandemic. I mean, five of us could do this roundtable discussion from different generation of Eisenman architects. It might not happen at all if we don't have this kind of things, you know, it's, mm. that's, this is several lining, I guess. So yeah, uh, since uh, five of you are already here, uh, I, I will say to say thank you again for joining with, with our small week, weekly series. And it's an honor. And yeah, I, I will let Alicia to take over again to start the roundtable discussion. Oh, before that, uh, for the audience, uh, after after the roundtable discussion, we're going to open uh, the Q&A for the public. So you, you could use your uh, raise hand feature in the management, manage participants. And yeah, uh, we, will, we, will, uh, we will pick the question after the roundtable discussion. Yes, Alicia, here you go. Great, um, can you hear me? Am I? Yeah, yeah. yes, you're yeah. on, okay, yes. Awesome. okay yes. great. Um, I, I just wanted to quickly maybe talk about the Wexner Center. I, uh, I stopped my presentation at the end of the house series, and that's obviously only the beginning of Peter's career. Uh, maybe, maybe I think Thomas was on this uh, on the competition for, for the Wexner Center for the Arts, and um, could, you, could you share a little bit how the process of uh, working on this project was, uh, if, if, you, if you can recall? Um, well, how the process of this was, you know, it, it's kind of, um, uh, God, this is also a long time ago, but I remember, you know, in those days, the office was very small, um, and uh, we kind of, um, you know, this was obviously an important project, it was a kind of, uh, you know, uh, something that um, Peter and I, I, I actually think, spent days and nights uh, uh, conceptualizing and thinking about it, and and um, and I don't quite remember who the competitors was. I may confuse this with the convention center, whether whether um, um, you know who who actually uh, we were competing against. Um, but you know, it's always a kind of discussion. What you know, the the kind of the other architects would potentially do, and I think Peter sort of um, was very interested in in this uh, condition of bet being between um, being between these two existing buildings, some sort of classical kind of, uh, one is an auditorium and the other one, I forgot a little bit what it is, but these are typical university buildings. And, um, and uh, um, Peter, you know, and, and at the time we actually, uh, he, we, we called him or he called himself Mr. In Between. Uh, and that was sort of his his position in this project that uh, um, you know being between these sort of classical buildings and squeezing this uh, 
kind of landscape uh, um, uh, into to turn the landscape into an, an architectural proposition and to resurrect the old armory in its kind of fragmentation as, a, as you know, because it had been erased had been demolished uh, at some point and um, um, of course obviously as we know Peter's interested in traces and and readings um, um, that, that sort of implied through the kind of architectural language. So this is this, this armory, you know, maybe it came, it came out a little bit too real in a certain way, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, it, it is, it is, a, it is sort of this, this question of, of um, this sort of past incomplete project and sort of incompleteness became something for me at least, uh, which is of an essential element of Peter's work and, and has become also very much of my own work in a way that, um, um, you know, the, the, if, you think of, if you think of the early sort of cubes with the missing corner, you know, there's always this, in, in that incompleteness lies the potential for reading what Peter called earlier things that you cannot see. Uh, and so here was this a project that, um, you know, this, this between those two existing buildings, it opened the possibility for things you cannot see by, by going right in between and inserting something that you, you, you would not know or would not expect to be possible. Um, and, uh, um, you know, these, you know the, 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 the grids, I don't need to talk much about the grids. I think we all know that the, the grid is an important element in, in Peter's work as a kind of reading device. Uh, you know, the grid of the city versus the grid of the university, which created these kind of two angles uh, in, in different scales of, of uh, how this landscape um, um, sort of uh, inserted itself um, between these two classical dominant buildings, which would suddenly was kind of really interesting. These buildings were suddenly not so dominant anymore. Um, um, and there was this kind of disturbance in it. And um, so, you know, we worked day and night on this thing. And um, I remember... Yeah, it's funny stories like Philip Johnson, uh, you know, Peter sort of every once in a while had this sort of, you know, conversation with Philip. And, and, and so he, 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 Philip Johnson said one day, okay, I'll come by and look at the project. And he came and looked at the project and said, Peter, you're not going to win. I said, Peter, why not? Why not? And Peter said, why, why don't we win with this? He said, I don't know where you enter this. Um, and it, and uh, you have to put a big arrow on the plan which says entrance. Then you have a chance. So, of course, you know, we did that and um, actually won the project. So maybe it's thanks to Philip Johnson that we won this because we may have missed this, this uh, moment. But, of course, this is the very thing about Peter's work that you don't know where the entrance is, that, you know, that, that you kind of, um, you, have to, you have to read a building before you can actually sort of uh, uh, understand it in a way. Um, well, is it the entrance? This white, um, the white grid. <laughs> well, you could the end. No, this is not the entrance. If you pass, the, if you go into this, if you walk through this grid, uh, you basically pass the building. You miss the building. You know that's sort of um, um, what sort of you know interesting about it. And if you look at the image on the right, you see this white arch. This is also not the entrance. It's not so. It's not so. You know, it's not so in your face. Um, um, how to read this building, and, and uh, um, I mean, this is what this is what Peter's work is about, right? It's not like uh, I guess um, um, what you know he would call strong form, like a classical building uh, has a very clear um, um, sort of understanding. Uh, uh, you know, what, what, I guess maybe maybe um, maybe the difference between a canonical building and a great building. Peter's buildings are not great buildings. Um, because great buildings are easy to read and easy to understand. You know, they're, they're, they're buildings that have to be read and have to be kind of deciphered in a, in a way. And that's what makes them interesting. So another question would maybe more directed towards Elisa and Ariane. Uh, how, how is working on a book with Peter uh, related to your current interests or how, how has that relationship been uh, developing? Um, I could, uh, Elisa, I'll, I can jump on that if we go a little bit uh, chronologically. Um, so when I was uh, working with Peter on 10 canonical buildings, we were also teaching studio at Yale, did a wonderful trip to Rome uh, to look at the archives. And 
And so we were looking at a lot of work that we were finding in Italy. Um, you, you spoke about the Palladian Villa, for example. And in working on the book, um, Peter w w was really describing this conversation between one architect to another, the way that what makes, you could take that term canonical and say it is part of a discourse uh, between architects about a set of architectural ideas that are transformed and inverted with each architect's uh, reinterpretation. Um, so I was looking at the Palladian Villas and I was curious about Vitkover's um, lopping off the, the Barquesa, the wings that house the animals. <laughs> and my, my work, the work I do at Harrison Atelier is uh, I've written on the post-human. I have, my built work is actually exploring ways to build for multiple species. So I could certainly find seeds of this, that when you're reading and researching and writing, the, there are a number of ideas that fit in the book and there are ideas that do not. And so some of these hypotheses about why, um, what have architects also left out of conversations um, was very much part of 10 canonical buildings for me personally. And some of those seeds were what I took to ground uh, my work on the post-human. And so I wrote a book, uh, an anthology with Routledge called Architectural Theories of the Environment, Post-Human Territory. And the concluding um, paragraph cites Peter's essay on post-functionalism, because again, the seeds, the seeds for one book <laughs> sometimes uh, spread new books, if you will. So I think that's maybe a roundabout way of describing it, but hopefully I, I address that question. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> on my end, I, working on the lateness book um, with Peter was really wonderful. And we worked on it um, first in the context of, of a course. Um, Peter had already written an essay that played with the term lateness. And so, you know, we said, let's use it for the seminar. And uh, we told, we basically framed it with a preliminary definition of what we thought lateness might be. Um, and then we asked the students to bring in examples of lateness. And uh, it was, it, it was extraordinarily, um, you know, productive and fun. And it's a slippery term. And just in the process of doing that, um, we kind of define and redefine the term and we tried to do it according to different uh, periods at first. We said, okay, what does, what does it mean in the modern? What does it mean in the postmodern? Um, and then we, we did it as a studio and the ideas really um, evolved and we were able to do um, together this deep reading of Adorno's writing on Beethoven. And you know, I think um, for me, what's fun what's the fundamental question that's at the core of this book is really what a paradigmatic shift really means. Um, what did it mean in music in Beethoven's time? What does it mean in architecture today? And um, I think Peter and I um, share a dissatisfaction with a lot of things about contemporary architecture. And so that question of sitting down together and asking what is the nature of, of this kind of change, of a paradigmatic shift. Um, you know, even if in the end, you know, I'm writing about different things and working on different things, that to me, there is this fundamental question of what is a paradigm shift and what does that take and what does it mean for a discipline? And, you know, it's interesting um, that uh, Alija, you brought up the question of convention and that much of what Peter's work does is a questioning of convention. And the word convention comes up a lot in the lateness book, actually. Um, uh, because what Adorno argues is that Beethoven was not the seed of the modern in the moment that he was defying convention entirely, but in his late works, he returns to convention. And uh, it's in his questioning directly of the convention and then manipulating the convention in order to reframe the relationship between the parts. It introduces the idea of the fragment and that's the seed for the modern, right? So um, there is this question, I think, that um, that comes up in, in the lateness book, which is that even our own attitude, attitudes toward convention can become normative. And, um, and that's something that has absolutely stayed with me and, and, and will stay with me going forward. <laughs> Um, 
And Erdem, uh, you worked on the Yenikapu project, uh, and that has been an amazing ongoing project. I've also worked on it uh, a few years back. And um, could you address some of the the uh, interesting aspects of it? I remember, I mean, these very large scale models that are built at the office are quite amazing because they're uh, made of cardboard and and uh, they're pretty uh, high, uh, big in scale. And what, what, what is the model, uh, how, how is the model important in the design process uh, at the office? I mean, um... I mean, as you know, it is kind of the, the, the one of the main tools that we use. Like even though, like we we use all kinds of digital uh, tools parallel to that, but it is kind of uh, the way that Peter also likes to uh, design and you know edit uh, things. Um, I mean, he like uh, also like test new ideas in that sense and um, like. Peter was actually like, mentioning this, like his uh, story about like um, his trip to Italy about this uh, like Palladian villa I mean, trip to Italy with Colin Rowe about like his, him standing in front of this Palladian villa and looking for something uh, that uh, is not visible there. Actually, I, like that reminded me. Uh, uh, what we were trying to do in unique of a project uh, with um, actually looking, looking at Hagia Sophia uh, building and uh, extracting a grid, which is actually not even there, like, uh, like from a building uh, which was built um, 1500 years ago, like uh, kind of extracting a, a, a tool, a, a, a conceptual um, phenomena that we actually uh, borrowed and used in uh, Yenikapu project, which uh, is actually defining um, the whole circulation. I mean, defining starting from uh, the, uh, the site plan to the circulation of the, of the building or even like programming of the building. And if you zoom in, uh, like you can even like see the other like, proportions of that uh, grid that we borrowed from Hagia Sophia. You can see it in the, like the millions of the of the curtain walls. So with this kind of like uh, that that story actually like directly reminded me our uh, process of like how we design and actually kind of cre created a uh, abstract uh, base for us, kind of a like a rule, a computational rule. That we generated our uh, our building design from that, and if like if you ask me if you can read it like if when you go to the building, not necessarily like I mean you 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 have to be like really familiar with I just Sophia like even though, like if if you are if you know the, those like both buildings very well, I'm not sure if you can relate it directly, but so that. That kind of connections that we always like, try to do, and uh, like you know, I was just thinking, like, how can you uh, design something will not be visible, uh, or like, I mean, can you start with that idea in the beginning? I mean, maybe not, but these kind of like uh, tools that you mentioned, like making tons of physical models and like analysis, the building analysis, like formal analysis of, of different buildings and kind of adapting the ideas to your design processes. Uh, actually like the way that I think uh, that we still use uh, in, in the office. Great. Um, now we might open uh, and I'm very curious to hear uh, questions from the audience. And I already see a few hands in the in the audience, but uh, maybe Randy, you, you want to moderate uh, how this goes? Yes. Um, okay, for everyone who actually have some questions for our five speakers tonight, or even just to to saying some thoughts or just to discuss something, 
please uh, put your uh, raise hand in, in the participants menu. But wait, that's it's uh, yeah, we are waiting. Any of you guys? <laughs> so yeah, they're still processing about the discussion that's going. Uh, I see. I see a question. Um, that's from Nathaniel who's saying, how does Henry Lefebvre's notion of social production of space compare oh. to those of Eisenman's notion of decoding space? Um, does anybody feel inspired about uh, responding to that? Where are you seeing with these questions? Are they in the chat or are they separate? Yes, they're in the chat. Oh, I, I got that one privately. Um, yep. Yes, so please please send your questions directly to uh, to the everyone chat. Or you can... Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe for, for the Indonesian's audience, uh, maybe some of you uh, also able to speak in Indonesian and I'll, I will translate it to you in case you have to feel free. Um, yeah. So I'll repost this. Um, I, so, I mean, I think okay. regarding that question, I'm, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's a complicated one in a sense. And I think that um, if, if Peter were here, he would tell you that he's not really that interested in social processes that, that, bring about the formation of, of space reform. Um, but I also don't necessarily think that that is a totally honest um, attitude on Peter's part, because for Peter, he's, he's absolutely interested in um, the ability of architecture to um, make you question your surroundings, which in the end is a, is a political act in, in Peter's mind. Um, and, so I think that there, there is sometimes an, an excess division between a you know, formal attitude and, and a political one. And I think that something that Peter believes is that the, um, the act of slowing down perception um, is, is an important one and something that architects can contribute to a city. So in a context where um, the kind of conventional production of architectural form or of built form according to processes of real estate. You know, there are all of these um, normative and economic and political factors that, that contribute to the shaping of the city. And in that context, the architect might be someone who kind of um, intersects something into that, into that process, which can make you sort of stop and question everything around you. So I think that there, um, there's something very important there. And, uh, you know, for Peter, it's very important to not believe that the person inside of a building is a passive subject, right? Not a receiving subject, but rather a perceiving subject. And if we can heighten the act of perception, um, you know, as Victor Slavsky would say, that the the mind engaged in an intellectual process is less co-opted by power, right? So, uh, or less easily co-opted by power, let's say. And so I think that there's something there in what Peter is interested in, which I find very valuable. Um, I could also just chime in. I think we would possibly want to add another uh, French uh, profound thinker, Michel Foucault, because um, if, we, if we recall to uh, Peter's founding the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York in the 70s through the 80s as a think tank and the kind of writing that was published through oppositions, we would find a number of interesting engagements with Michel Foucault's writing. I think that what I would insert in that question is Foucault's suggestion that, that liberation, let's say free thought is a practice, that architecture cannot build freedom, it cannot build the conditions of social liberty, it is, but it can build the conditions for you to think and and that that is where i think much of peter's discourse of 
analyzing, cutting apart convention, demonstrating a kind of conversation among architects who, who pick out different points, architectural elements, for example, a corner, um, an entrance, if you will, to not find the entrance of a building on some sense means you have to really think about it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's consistently inserting these ways that it is not the architecture that is producing freedom like a product, but it is producing the conditions for the, the user of the space to think. And maybe that's uh, a name that we should should insert um, into this discussion as well. Yeah, absolutely. Randy, would you like to move to another question, or I can also? Uh, uh, yeah, there there are two person who ask now. Okay. Uh, 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 yeah, I will uh, invite the first person. Uh, Yasmin, are you there? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, as you know, Yasmin, uh, maybe is the first Indonesian who ever worked as an intern in Eisenman's, I guess, three years ago, Yasmin? Yeah, in t 2016, uh, actually. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Yasmin. Great Hello, to see Alicia. you. Hello, Alicia. Really nice to see you. It was a great presentation, by the way. Thank you very Thank much. You, also, Yasmin. hi, Erdem and Elisa. Hi. Also, Mr. Thomas and Ms. Harrison. So I have a question since I, I hear a lot of the time when I was at the office, Peter and also Mirka back then uh, talk a lot about close reading. So, uh, and also Alijan mentioned the term uh, earlier and I'm really curious about that and I uh, would like to hear like maybe anyone of you can explain your uh, perception of this close reading in, in Ar uh, Eisenman architecture since you have worked very closely with him. So probably that would be my question. Thank you. Um, I could maybe jump on that because I think that the book 10 Canonical Buildings is very much, I, I think it's it was an extraordinary project to work uh, with Peter on. He had taught, I think, five years of seminars on how to close read buildings uh, while he was teaching at Princeton. And the, the book emerged, um, that 10 was a larger group that every, every year working with to scrutinize to look at representation, to really start to read the, the differences. The, you could look for any of you that have or will be going to Rome at some point to see the Casa uh, Gerso, and you'll see that the Moretti staircase has a very strange moment. If you look at this section of the building, as you're walking up the stairs, there is a gap between the second to last top stair and a landing. And so, again, this idea that gets highlighted in interpreting an architecture, uh, interpreting a building with a narrative, and that, that narrative may matter to you in a different way than it matters to a different generation. So that, that is where the conversation, the discursive aspect of architecture continues. It continues among the 10 different architects in the book, but it continues with all of you as you use precedent to inform work. And I think that's another extremely important element of, of Peter's of is to, to suggest that the body of architecture, the discipline is extremely rich and allows us to um, work against the grain of prior architecture. It gives you some, some material to work with. Yes. Because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, may I also add uh, from my question? Because when I heard about uh, Peter's story about uh, being asked to see what is uh, invisible, like what what did you not see from that building? I feel like that kind of relates to this close reading idea. I think with close reading, we have to add a little bit of misreading too. <laughs> well, we the, are. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, let me maybe you know this this close reading. Of course, um, the the. Um, Ten canonical buildings is also very much about Peter's work because it's all about how to read Peter's work, of course. Right? Um, um, but it's sort of uh, when we did the um, um, choral uh, work project uh, with you know the book and Derrida and Peter and, and also Bernard Schumi, um, it was kind of very interesting because obviously there's you know there's a very precise text. Uh, about the kind of you know the, the philosophy and the questioning and, and you know and, and this this idea of 
architecture is text and you know as Derrida says everything is text um, what we did uh, which got a lot of people very upset is actually we punched holes throughout the book one side is Peter's um, La Villette grid and the other side is Chumi's um, uh, no, it's sorry, it's not, it's, it's, it's the Venice um, can, can retrograde. And so these two two holes meeting in the middle, and the, the beginning of the book is actually right in the middle, and you can read to the left and to the right. But people got very upset because they suddenly words were missing. And um, uh, and so this is what you were just saying, Ariane, that this this close reading is also your interpretation. You know, you, it's, not, it's not prescribed, it's not totally preset. It's sort of something you need to carefully look and you make your own, you make your kind of own um, 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 reading of it. And I think this is sort of what we were trying to do in, in Coral Works is, um, you know, that it allows... Then with the missing words allows you for you to to fill in what you think this may mean or what it means for you right? and, and so I think that's sort of like very important uh, that it's not prescribed because if, if it's like too prescribed it becomes like uh, it becomes sort of like a you know strong form this is easy to read it's the, the whole point is that it actually allows your own interpretation to, to filter in and and, um, um, and and create your own uh, reading of it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And and just to add, um, Peter and I still taught together again last semester at Cooper in the fall, and we taught a formal analysis studio. And um, and then I also, you know, I TA'd formal analysis. I yelled with him for two years, and then as a, a co-teacher for another two years. So, you know, a lot of my formation was sitting next to Peter, reading buildings with him and with the students and having the students... Um, bring forward buildings that we had seen many times but e inevitably every single semester there was some unexpected reading that you know both of us would sit there and be like I never had seen that before in this building even though we've already you know Peter has done this class hundreds of times I had already done it you know five times and um so I think that the there is something in close reading that it's also an act of invention. It's also, it's an act of misreading, but also rereading and about thinking about the relationships that are internal to the building that, that can be generative of another idea. And so it, I would think of close reading always as generative. It's not really just about understanding a precedent and like memorizing the relationship between the parts. That's not what it is. It's about reinventing the relationship between the parts and reinterpreting them. I think these are great elements of answer to the question of close reading. Um, there, there's a question that if I may move on uh, between um, the saying, is there a balance between form and function in Eisenman's work? And if so, how is it created? I think it might be interesting to address uh, form and function because, uh, because well, you, you, you tell me. Um, I might have a story about that, actually. Um, when I was a student and I was in Peter's studio, um, I was working with... Uh, a friend of mine, Brittany Edding, um, and, um, you know, we, it was maybe the first week that we were presenting a design. And so, you know, we said to ourselves, okay, this is it, you know, like we have to put together something like highly conceptual, something very, um, you know, something between abstraction and, um, and the physical. And so we made, we intersected two grids, of course, because it was an Eisenman studio and we extruded it and we made this model and it was made out of two kinds of wood and they had all all of these beautiful intersections and uh we we brought it to the studio and peter looked at it and he said oh my god are those are each of those individual towers like does each of those and he totally misread the scale he was like does each of those have an elevator like what how are you going to circulate through that like what about light and air and we were sitting there like what <laughs> is this the conversation we're having like we thought our model was like highly conceptual and, um, and, and what I realized over time is that for, for Peter, a building has to function in order for it to transcend its function so that the function doesn't come up, right? But, but it absolutely has to function because it's a building, right? And he will always say that architecture is not sculpture. They are not the same thing. Um, but the, the conceptual potential of the architecture does not have to be at the expense of it being a building that works. Um, and in fact, the opposite. If it works, then you don't have to talk about it. And that's... 
you know, you can just uh, move on to other ideas. Is there any of you guys have another story related to uh, Elisa's opinion? Well, oh, I, I, I could just touch on that, that I think part of the close reading raises a number of questions about how does the building function function i think in in closely reading a building and its elements one starts to understand very clearly that buildings are meant to function for some and not for others that they have a series of prescriptions and there is a architecture is such a huge field it is not it is not hard to sail through your your education without asking a lot of hard questions about um, how a building functions, for whom, and one you could argue that that work such as the work I do, asking why should it only function for one species, um, I think that that grows out of this practice. Um, so the question of function is. I completely agree with what Elisa said that that it must function, but I think also in the close reading, the misreading, and in the interpretation, we have he gives us the tools to ask for whom should it function and does it function in an equitable fashion? Um, could we how does that that all of these tools of reading and misreading are are ways to make it function uh, differently as well? There's of course also the the, um, the question you asked about function. Uh, yes, as Elisa says, like you know, the building has to function because otherwise it's sculpture. But they, you know, in 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 Peter's work, is of course also a lot of things that don't function. Um, we should also have to ask what is not functioning. I mean, if the you know the Wexner Center came up earlier, there are stairs that don't lead anywhere. There are columns that don't touch the ground. Um, you know, so there's a, there's this, uh, this this important question of of these um, you know that one has not one one cannot take function as the kind of primary driver for the architecture and um, that, that there are things that have nothing to do with function and they're uh, possibly even more important than than the kind of conventional functional things. Okay, um, should we move to another question, maybe? Uh, there are, uh, uh, okay, Olivia Emanuela, oh, well, from Hi. Autonom Studio. Yeah, actually, oh, okay. Olivia, but he's, yeah, 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 yeah. Two of you. okay, doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, hi everyone, okay. thanks um, for the presentation. Uh, I just want to ask two questions, actually. So, the first one is, how and why did Eisenman actually ended up using this Cartesian grid on virtually almost any mm. or almost all of his projects actually. Yeah, like, it's very prominent. Yeah, this is very prominent on, on all of his projects, even if he's not obviously not the first one or the only architect who's 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 already considered this kind of approach. Uh, yeah, approach on mm. and and kind of uh, concerns of axis and grid. Um, in generating some kind of space in architecture, and doesn't seem to, uh, yeah, doesn't seem to be different in each context. Yeah, like, and and the fact that it's it's mm. it's so prominent even when we took any of his building and kind of like represent it in any form of orthogonal drawing, like the section or the elevation or the side plan, even you can see these qualities uh, resonating in each and every mm. aspect. And the second one is like. Uh, I've read an article about uh, I forgot words, but it was connected to his Berlin uh, Jewish memorial, and he mentioned something about uh, the death on a of an author and the fact that he he had some kind of goal in eliminating a self expression in architecture. But uh, yeah, I just I'm just curious about what that means and uh, why is it why is it important for him to kind of like eliminating this sense of out, like uh, authorship in architecture, in a way. Uh, yeah, I think that's the, the question. Okay, that's two questions. Um, okay, uh, who wants to answer? Bert? Well, please do, I hope you guys. I mean, just uh, about the grid. Um, 
you know the 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 it, uh, there is um a lot in architecture a lot of kind of discussion about references and so on and most of them are the formal references and peter peter's references are not formal they they you know they basically like they they're signed so the grid uh you know is goes back throughout history in in you know foundation of founding cities and so on the you know the, the cardo de Gamanum, um orientation to north and north so there's a rest to you know in, in berlin for example uh, the uh, the 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 uh, war museum that was built the ref it references uh the, the the grid of the city of berlin and and in different kind of relationships the grid to the wall the the, the berlin wall was in a different orientation uh, so it's 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 um um it's a kind of uh it's 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 basically a again a text by which you can understand how the project is situated against uh, a kind of historic um, 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 context without using formal uh, you know like materials or shapes or, or sort of uh, short formal references so so in a way it's it's kind of like so the grid is like a free entity where he could easily like uh, overlay on top of any context well, point? yeah, I mean, in Columbus, you know, the Wexner Center, the the grid is, is the relationship of the city to the to the university campus. They're two different grids, they, you know, and so the campus is its own uh, uh, economic and political entity, and the city is a different economic political entity, and they overlay. There's this kind of, you know, and, and the grid out of this overlay, out of the di difference be be between the two, is generated a kind of in between condition, as I sort of mentioned earlier, and that, that allows a kind of relationship between two entities mm. Mm. Okay. okay anyone else want to put some addition and what about the the death the death of the author thing the mm. second yeah. well um it's about an anti a kind of an, an, a move against authority, you know, kind of dismantle authority to to take down the kind of the architect as that sup, as the superhero and the over the over um, um, figure in a way um, uh, to kind of mm. to to destroy the, the kind of authority of of, uh, of the architect, right? And, and um, uh, so that's an important, um, you know, to 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 avoid a kind of. Uh, um, glorification of, of you know this kind of master builder which is the kind of traditional idea of what the architect is i also think it has to do with this idea that a work has an infinite possibility of readings right that the author is not the authority as to the meaning of the work but rather that the work once it goes into the world um will constantly be read and reread an infinity of times and its meaning will never be stable Mm, right. um, yeah, my cousin, who's a sociologist, also just texted me. It might be because of uh, Foucault's uh, text, uh, who, again, in post structuralism, defends that uh, words and texts also become or can become uh, authorless. Uh, and, and that might be linked also in Eisenman's uh, adaptation of the thought into architecture. Mm. Um, I think we could also add to that that question of uh, the death of the author, the implication of as Elisa, uh, as Elisa was saying, an almost infinite process. So if you if you start with a house series, or you go, you know, if you really look through Peter's work, including his extremely early anticipation of the digital, I think with uh, biology, the biologist centrum, I think. I think he did that with, I think that was with Greg Lynn has an interesting story about sort of manually um, developing a digital process. But the, the idea would be that there is a process rather than an author. There's a series of moves or instructions that, that can unfurl um, without, again, the strict authority um, that uh, that I think is is kind of an antagonist in a lot of Peter's work and thinking. Yeah. Okay. 
like how is it guys yeah, yeah it's a very interesting key point yeah. thank you okay thank you for the question uh, rico and Olo. uh moving to another question i will uh please timmy says no are you there oh uh, yes good evening and good day everyone um i would like to ask the panelists about the idea of um, inducing questions when people um, experience the, the space that we design. How does one induce such question? And does confusion is one of the main factor that plays in inducing such question? And does the question is meant to be unanswer unanswered and unanswered um, question or does it have an answer? Thank you. Okay. Any of you? Well, I, I think um, confusion is not necessarily uh, the, 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 the necessary strategy. I mean, it's a possible strategy. Um, and I don't think that there is necessarily an answer either. I think it is most important uh, to, to um, when confronted with a piece of architecture like, like Peter's work, um, that one is, is, is raising questions that, 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 may, um, that may impact or, or interest or concern yourself uh, and the environment and the political context in which you're in. Um, and and there is so there is no prescribed question. It's not like that the design produces a particular question, and there is no answer that particular answer. But it is it is the design, or the you know the work is there to to um, make you aware of things around you in a way that you know if you if you look at a sort of you know sort of strong form architecture, if you look at the you know, Bill Bauer project, you know, it's like, yes, this must be a museum. It's, you know, it's a certain kind of architecture. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, it doesn't necessarily question much. You go in, you know, this because of the type of architecture it must be a museum is sort of the answer. Um, and uh, uh, more complex works makes you more wonder, it's like, why is this or what is this? And the questions are um, basically have to be answered by your own questioning. This is not the architect cannot provide the answer. Um, um, you know, no, no, a kind of specific question, I would say. Hmm. Yeah, I would okay. argue that confusion is not the the only path towards asking a question, and I think that um, for me, a lot of this has to do with thinking about an architectural work that, whose meaning is open, and. Um, so, you know, as we think about that as architects ourselves, um, do we assume that we know the meaning of a thing or do we accept that its meaning will always change over time? And, um, and I think that um, there are so many different strategies to make uh, a, a person who enters a building to question something. And it may simply be about... Um, making something seem slightly unfamiliar. It could be subtle, right? And um, I think that the, um, the desire to make sure that people are questioning things is not a desire to incite confusion, but rather a desire to encourage a kind of alertness. And, um, and I think that, you know, it's interesting to see um, how complex spaces can actually, you know, inspire and, and make someone curious and, 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 you know, interested in moving through a space. And um, that doesn't have to be through disorientation, but rather it could also be through curiosity. So they're, they're just infinite modes. And I would say that um, a, a desire to force questioning is not oppressive or, um, you know, necessarily uh, fetishizing something negative in order to be transgressive, but rather it's the recognition that the person who is inside the building is a thinking subject. And I think it's also to honor the, the thought process of the person that's there. And I think that sometimes um, there's a discourse right now that says that an overly 
complicated architecture is is undemocratic. And I think that that can be true in certain cases, but I think it also um, doesn't necessarily always honor the intellect of, of the person moving through the space, right? There's also a question of, of like, how do we make sure that spaces are, um, you know, delightful to, to so many aspects of the human mind, right? Um, it's not always so simple. And I think that, um, that yeah, the, the desire for questions to be a part of an experience can be more about um, wanting to encourage a kind of variety of, of experiences moving through a space, which can then in themselves have an open meaning, right? And the, the change from one space to another can mean many things to many people. And so it's always assuming that there isn't a single meaning um, or a single experience or a singular experience. And we could we could also say that we could take all of these um, all of these points from uh, Tomas and Elisa and say there is more to a building than walking through it. You know, we have a wealth of documentation that I think part of what Eisenman gives us are so many examples of architectures performing their own questions through their drawing. We could look at Bramante's redrawing his buildings prior to publication or um, in the chapter on Le Corbusier that we did on 10 canonical buildings, and this actually touches on uh, the lateness issue that, that Elisa um, has been writing on and publishing on. Um, it, he shows us with the Palais de Congrès of Strasbourg, an example, his, Peter's narrative is that Le Corbusier set forth initially a very clear set of methodologies, the five points, super clear, you know, we all know them. But then by the end, to, as he as his as he's aging, as he's thinking through uh, his career, I think he was do, working, I forgot the dates of the Palais de Strasbourg, but um, he starts to question and starts to invert his own precepts. And there is an argument that the Palais de Strasbourg is actually an overturning, an inversion, an undermining, a questioning, if you will, of his own extreme 